Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me uh, again. Uh, my name is Thomas, and today I'm going to be speaking about uh, Gatsby JS. So, in the uh, in accordance with tradition, I'll now ask who's heard of Gatsby JS. Okay, so uh, a little less than half. So I, I hope uh, if you haven't, then you'll get something useful out of this. So just a disclaimer: um, this is quite a when I was when I was thinking about exactly what to speak about. Um, I realized that this is quite a there's a lot to talk about. So I'm gonna give a pretty high level overview. Okay, and I'm not gonna get too uh, detailed. Um, and, I'm, and it's going to be mostly theoretical, um, partly because I don't want to bore everyone, um, but partly also because after me, uh, my friend Thor will be doing a practical uh, demonstration. So without further ado, um, let's start. Uh, so I've subtitled my talk, Back to the Future, and you'll see why uh, a little bit later. Um, and by the way, uh, you can just call it Gatsby, but uh, I got into the habit of calling it Gatsby JS because every time I googled um, for help, I kept getting this guy. <laughs> so uh, that was not helpful. Um, okay, a little bit about me. I'm a front end developer at DBS, uh, React lover, uh, and lover of other things. Um, that's my Twitter handle. There's two underscores just in case um, you're wondering. And my scope will be broadly these, these three things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about websites in general and how they've evolved over time. Um, I will then give a quick introduction to Gatsby.js um, and then just do a little bit uh, of a slightly deeper dive into two aspects, which is um, the data layer and GraphQL. OK, so websites, once upon a time, um, were pretty simple. You had a bunch of HTML files that corresponded to your different pages. Uh, you had CSS files. You had JavaScript uh, files. And, and I know that they're basically still the same now, but, uh, but what, what you saw when you looked into the web server last time was pretty understandable. Now it's you know, less so. Um, so yeah, you'd, you'd have you know, one page, one HTML page for, for one page, that, one, one separate URL. Um, and the, the data in these sites would be, in a sense, tightly coupled to the, the site code. The site code is, is the code that you use to, to actually run the site. Um, so this is like a, you know, a basic HTML page. You, you can see that the, the data is, is kind of mixed in with the HTML, right? Which, which makes sense because that's the, the way you, you present the data. Um, there's not really anything like a build pipeline, right? You pretty much just send stuff up. Um, so, uh, so, so, so that's 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 our starting like uh, that, that's our starting point, okay? Um, so, so uh, once upon a time, things were like that, right? Re really simple. Now, I'm skipping ahead a bit here, um, and I'm going to touch on. Uh, 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 Frameworks like Angular and React, which uh, which come under the umbrella of single page applications, okay, or rather they, they are frameworks which allow you to create single page applications. Um, so we we saw a departure from what we just looked at previously, where there was a lot of tight coupling, where we uh, we we could we could start to separate um, separate concerns a bit more, okay, and. Uh, one of the things that happened was we started to do a lot more stuff in JavaScript, right? Everything from handling the the URLs as well, right? That that could be done in in JavaScript. So that's why uh, that that's how single page applications work, right? It's in its pure form, it has just a single HTML page, and the other pages are actually not real HTML pages. They are um, handled by a, a client side um, router. So basically, you JS all the things, um, and yeah, like I mentioned, it's the data 
then it can be highly uncoupled. So you can actually have your data somewhere else and you can fetch it with uh, you know, a, a network request and you pass that data back into your, your UI and your, your UI is not concerned, your, your, your UI has, is not really concerned with the data itself. It's just expecting some, some usually a JSON object and uh, it renders that um, when you actually run the website. So one of the things that came out of this was that SEO search engine optimization wasn't so good um, for various reasons, such as um, you, you don't always get an idea of what the content is based on. So I, I'm actually not 100% sure about this because I can't find a definitive answer. Some people say that the crawlers can actually render everything. Some people say they can't. But basically, there's this question about whether your website appears to have any content in it when it's visited by a crawler. Um, and if it appears not to have any content in it, then that's not very good for your, your page rankings. Um, and sometimes there are performance issues as well, because what's happening is you are um, usually downloading a fairly large JavaScript file. Uh, and even if you, you can do things like code splitting and all that, but essentially if you are very concerned about things like time to first byte, then um, you, you might have concerns about performance um, because it's kind of, the, the, the application in a way has to be bootstrapped, right? Because you're sending back uh, an empty HTML shell, which then gets stuff injected into it by the JavaScript. Okay, so that's part two. Um, now part three, what happened was that, amongst other things, people tried to solve these issues that we, we were facing. So things like the um, search engine optimization. Um, React in particular has a method called render to string where you can pass a, um, a, a React component which uh, could represent your entire application and it would render that to static HTML and this basically a long story short allows you to uh, respond to a server request with HTML with, with uh, HTML that has data in it already okay so rather than sending an empty HTML structure and then later on injecting the data in, you could kind of pre-render the data for that initial load, send it back down to the client and then carry on as normal. So th this helped with things like, um, like I mentioned before, time to first byte because you'd immediately get some useful HTML that you could, you could display to the user. Um, so, so that's where uh, things like render to string came from. Uh, yeah, so this allows you to essentially run a server and every request you can, uh, you can render to string to, to uh, pass that initial HTML with relevant data for that route. And then later on you can you carry on the bootstrapping process that you do normally, um, but it's kind of partially done already. So just to uh, illustrate exactly what that looks like, uh, you would pass something like app into uh, render to string and it would give you out it would it would output something like what you see on the right so as you can see on the left there's a lot of dynamic data there the user is is a, is dynamic data items and so on and what it allows you to do is kind of like at a moment in time get a representation in html of what all the data is okay all right, so part four is kind of an extension. It's, it's, it's an extension of render to string. Uh, in particular, it's how a certain class of tools used tools like render to string to um, combine what we saw originally, which was websites which have multiple HTML pages with the developer experience of building a React application using something like Create React App. Uh, and I'm, I will refer to these as static site generators, and, and these are not necessarily new. Uh, I'm speaking about them specifically in the context of, uh, I, guess the, I guess, React for, for Gatsby. Um, so the developer experience is like single page applications. You get all that. You can still do all your um, uncoupled data and UI 
but the UX, and, and when I say UX, I mean the visitor's experience is like the good old websites where uh, every, every URL you visit has a, uh, has a HTML structure which you can get immediately. There's no like empty HTML which you have to wait to get bootstrapped with data and, and things like that. So how does it do that? It actually generates content during build time. So you can think of it as having like a, you have a React application that we know and love, uh, a single page application. When you build this React application, it will, uh, it will determine all your different URLs and it will build a page, a HTML page for each of these. So what you get from the output is actually something that looks very similar to part one, right? Which is multiple HTML pages for each uh, for each location, um, as well as all your CSS and, and, and other JavaScript files. So what the, the benefit of this is that if you have data which changes fairly often, but not that often, you can actually, uh, you, you can generate that and it, in a sense hard code it into your HTML. So let's say you have a blog which you update say once a week. So once a week you have a entry which might be like a new page, right? So uh, blog slash ID. Uh, if you were building a React application to, to serve this, you'd have a component which, which renders blog content, right, Gen generically. And when a user visits your website, they, this, uh, this page will fetch the relevant blog data from your CMS. Um, and and display it. What a static site generator allows you to do is move that step forward to the to to build time, and allows you to build separate pages for all your content, and then s serve those up in your in your web server. So it's so it's more performant, right? Because um, you. You, you don't have this empty HTML lying around. You have actually fully, um, fully rendered HTML. Uh, but once your app is running, you get all the benefits of a single page application framework like React. So yeah, it's kind of a middle ground. Okay, um, on to Gatsby itself. So Gatsby is an example of a static site generator. Uh, it, what it allows you to to do is create websites using React, right? So uh, if you love React, then you can use Gatsby to for your projects. Um, they espouse uh, this concept of bring your own data, which means that uh, your data can actually live anywhere. So you can put your data on um, a content management service like Contentful or your own backend service, or where else? Uh, basically anywhere, okay, I've got a picture later. Um, and what it will do is it will output um, static web, web uh, assets like, like React does normally, but like I said, it, it does this in a way that matches the structure of your actual website. Um, and with that, you can deploy that to your normal document storage like S3, Netlify, GitHub pages, static files. So unlike what we had with render to string, which normally you would have to run a, a server, um, you don't have to do that here. So what's happening is this render to string or some method like render to string is happening during the build process and it's giving you all these separate pages which you can uh, serve. Okay, here's a picture. So I've taken this from the Gatsby website and as you can see at the top, you have your data sources, which can be anything. The next step is you build, and what you get out is HTML, CSS, and React. And then you can deploy it uh, on the... Now, I'm reaching the end already, but I just wanted to touch on this data layer because I mentioned bring your own data. So there's a question here which is, okay, I've got my data, let's say it's in Contentful, and now I need to 
put that into my React application somehow. So what Gatsby has is this thing called a data layer. So what you do is you define where your data is from and you define how to uh, extract that from where it is and put it into Gatsby. And most of the time you can use a plugin. So Gatsby has a pretty rich ecosystem of plugins. Um, there's currently, so I took this yesterday, there's 748, um, but there's always new ones being added. And plugins do one of three things. They source data, which means they put it into the data layer. They transform data, which means they take data that's already been put into the data layer and, and transform it somehow. Um, and finally, plugins can also work on other plugins. So if you really like plugins, then you can put a plugin on your plugin. Um, now if you're, so, so this, is, this is an example of what a plugin might look like, but also if there's a plugin which doesn't suit your needs, then you can specify your own ways of, um, of sourcing data. So this is just an example. So exports dot, dot source nodes is part of the Gatsby API. So, so this is a, a specific um, function which you will use and it get, gets called with a bunch of things. Uh, and what you do is in here you can fetch your data. So for example, if your data is, at, is residing at uh, mydata.com, excuse the typo, um, then you can fetch that data and you, let's say you get a, um, a JSON object with your blog content. You then do a little bit of transformation to get it in a format that uh, is suitable for the Gatsby data layer. And then finally at the bottom, you call create node with all this data. So as you can see, there's a couple of things there like ID, parent, um, children, and so on. But my, my data itself is also going in there. So uh, what you, you end up with is you end up putting uh, your, your data into the data layer. So once it's in the data layer, you need a way to actually access that data in your React applications. And the way that Gatsby lets you do that is it exposes a GraphQL interface. Okay, so you can think of the data layer now as like it's your virtual backend, I guess. Um, you've specified that you want some data to be in there. And then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to uh, access that data from your components. So the way you do that is, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into GraphQL itself because I think that'll be, that's kind of a separate topic. Um, but you write a query that looks something like this. Um, you specify the, the type of your node, which uh, if you look down, can I, can I point? Yeah, if you look down here, you, you specify a, a type here. And that corresponds to the type that you access here. And then you, you kind of have to traverse through a few layers of, of um, standard uh, interface, so edges and node. And then you finally get to the data that you have put into the data layer. Right? So, so once you get to, to this point, you have, th this, is, this, is this is essentially what you've got, what you've fetched here. Okay, so, so that's how you access it. And um, the rest of this is GraphQL syntax. So that's, if you're familiar with that, then um, this should look very normal to you. And basically, you get this data passed to your component as a prop. So specifically in Gatsby, uh, the way you do this is in a single file, you'll uh, specify a com single component and a single uh, query and it is it will do a little bit of magic and give you the output of that query as a data prop so data dot all my node type um, and it's an array so then you can access that in your component there's a couple of other ways of, of doing it as well um, those of you familiar will know about like static query and stuff like that um, same principle. Um, so that's basically it. Um, I, I, I don't want to get too in-depth. I think 
it's probably easier if you see stuff happening, so I will defer that to the next speaker. Um, but I just wanted to give everyone a, a, like a super high level overview of what Gatsby is, um, a little a touch on the data layer as well, because I was uh, confused by that myself when I first started. Um, and yes, I'll take any questions. Nope. Any questions? Yep. How does uh, Gatsby differ from other static websites? Uh, so the question is, how does Gatsby differ from other static site generators? Uh, I've only used one other one, which is uh, React Static, and I can't remember how that one works. So. I'm afraid I can't really give a good answer to that. Um, I'd like to open it up to the floor, though. If anybody has like done a static site generator show off, a showdown. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Can you speak louder? If you compare to static site generator like Kegel, it's normally So, so I think um, uh, that, that was a response to, to your question, uh, which was basically that, uh, I, I paraphrase, uh, let me know if I'm wrong, that uh, Gatsby is a lot more flexible in terms of how you get data into your site. So something like Jekyll, you, you use a Markdown, uh, but with Gatsby, you can, you can get content from Markdown. So you can write Markdown files in your project and then uh, source them, transform them into HTML. Uh, or you can get them from basically anywhere else. So from, from files on the file system, uh, remote uh, resources across the network, um, anything you can think of. I think the cool thing is that you can use GraphQL to access all the different data sources. So you, you have this unified data layer to access Markdown files, you know, REST APIs, other GraphQL APIs, Stripe you know, whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, I may be misunderstanding something, right? So for a static website, maybe it doesn't need a lot of authentication, but like for example, if uh, I have a uh, website in both, right, and I want to access additional content for the subscription, so does the data layer allow authentication? Um, so the question is, uh, if I have a website which has some parts of it that are protected by authentication, does the data layer um, allow authentication? Yeah. Uh, so let me answer a separate question first, which is that um, you, can, you can mix, uh, you can have a hybrid solution in terms of the pages. So the pages themselves can be protected by authentication. Um, you don't have to, you don't have to have one HTML page per um, per URL route that you want. So you can put um, you can put uh, a, a, se a section of your app can behave exactly like a traditional tr traditional React single page application. Um, in terms of the data layer itself, though, uh, I don't know because the data layer because at runtime the data is already there, right? The data is already loaded into the data layer. The data layer itself is kind of not, uh, it's gone at runtime, right? It's just, it just exists at de like develop and build time. Um, so I'm not sure about that, actually. Uh, I, I suspect that if you wanted to do that, you'd have to keep that data outside uh, and host it uh, or, or protect it like you normally would in a, in a dynamic uh, web application. Yeah, I think. Sorry, can I jump yeah. in? Yeah, I think what we generally do is 
you can use OAuth, uh, which kind of a third-party um, auth provider like Auth Zero, um, and you would then have the content in an API, um, and you would perform authentication only if um, you know the user is authenticated. They would be able to access the content from the API. At that point, it wouldn't be static, though. Yeah. Um, this is some sort of a trivial question, but I'm just curious. Okay, um, why is it named Gatsby GS? <laughs> <laughs> wow, um, you got me there, man. Uh, I, I I really don't know. Let me. Uh, <laughs> hmm. Let, let, let me think. Um, I have no internet, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that one. Anyone know that? You can speculate. <laughs> Because it's a big party of all the different data sources. I believe it. It's probably not <laughs> true, but it's my interpretation. <laughs> OK. Any other questions? One more? So um, can you still access to the data layer GraphQL when the site is after view? Uh, what do you mean exactly? So sorry, the question is, can so you? Can you like, access to a Graph IQL to the website after the so the question is, can you still access um, the GraphQL after, after it's built? Yeah. Uh, so I believe the short answer is no, because once it, the, the whole point of GraphQL is um, as you're developing, it's just a way for you to declare what data you need in your components. So once it's built, there is no GraphQL server running anywhere. The GraphQL server is just running as you're developing at, uh, while it builds to to kind of keep that data there. And then once it's built, the, the data is in in your HTML or, or your JS or whatever. And then and then the uh, there's, there's no more GraphQL server. But whilst you're developing, you can run a, a graphical um, server to kind of debug or, or check what data you have. Is Gatsby highly dependent on GraphQL? I believe it is. I believe that's an opinionated decision that um, that is the uh, tool that the, the authors of Gatsby have decided to expose for, for users of Gatsby. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no, well, OK. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there's no alternative to GraphQL. Um, but you. GraphQL is the way you interface with the data layer, right? So how much data you need in the data layer is dependent on your project. Um, so, so you could have a project which doesn't get any data from the data layer, um, which, does, which gets it all like uh, through an Axios request or something at, at runtime, let's say. Um, maybe your data is changing very frequently or it needs to be protected behind authentication, then you would not put your data in the data layer to be built into the output. Um, so it's, it's not possible, it's not, uh, it's not mandatory to kind of, if you're against GraphQL, it's not saying that you have to, to use it to, to work with Gatsby, but it is a big part. But, but the data layer itself is a big part of Gatsby and the way you interface with that is through, a, is through GraphQL. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so so the Gatsby documentation is actually pretty good. It doesn't assume any knowledge of GraphQL or even React. Um, there's a section. Uh, or there's actually a couple of sections on React itself. So it's um, it's pretty good. 